Good morning, and welcome to the United States Department of Justice Criminal Division Press Conference. All participants will be in listen-only mode. Should you need assistance, please signal a conference specialist by pressing the star key followed by zero. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to the Department of Justice. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for joining us here today. My name is Brian Rabbit. I'm the Acting Assistant Attorney General for the Department's Criminal Division. Over the course of the past six months, the COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc across our country and presented unprecedented challenges for ordinary Americans from all walks of life. In addition to inflicting a devastating toll in terms of human lives lost, the pandemic has caused widespread economic disruption that has harmed countless American businesses, American workers, and American families. Despite these challenges, the administration has taken a number of important steps to combat the pandemic and the economic crisis that it has caused. On March 27th of this year, Congress passed and President Trump signed into law a sweeping set of relief measures in the CARES Act. As part of the CARES Act, the federal government made hundreds of billions of dollars in forgivable loans available to American businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program, or the PPP. These PPP loans were made available to businesses so that they would have funds available to keep paying their workers in order to avoid catastrophic, catastrophic job losses during a time of national emergency. As President Trump made clear when he signed the CARES Act into law, the PPP was intended to provide a much needed lifeline to American businesses and American workers who, through no fault of their own, were suffering terribly during this national emergency. By the time the PPP closed to new applications on August 8th of this year, over 5.2 million loans had been made for a total loan amount in excess of $525 billion. These loans were made to businesses in virtually all sectors of the economy, from manufacturing and construction to healthcare, education, and the arts. These loans allowed American businesses to keep paying their employees and in turn allowed those employees to continue paying their rent, mortgages, and bills and to keep putting food on their families' tables. In short, the PPP program represented critical help at a critical time. Unfortunately, almost every crisis brings out not only those who seek to help others, but those who try to exploit the situation for their own unlawful purposes and financial gain. Early on, Attorney General Barr recognized that this pandemic would prevent, present fraudsters and other bad actors with a unique opportunity to take advantage of the crisis, and he directed the Department of Justice to take swift action to protect law-abiding Americans. At Attorney General Barr's direction, the Department of Justice has taken a number of important steps to combat pandemic-related fraud. One area of particular focus for us here at the Department has been the PPP program. Experience has taught us that any time the federal government makes a large amount of money available to the public on an expedited basis, the opportunities for fraud are unfortunately clear. The Criminal Division, and the Criminal Division's fraud section in particular, moved quickly to combat fraud in connection with the PPP program. We quickly set up a team dedicated specifically to PPP fraud. We began investigating almost immediately, and we brought our first cases within months of the PPP being announced and making its first loans. In fact, we brought cases while loans were still being made. We did this not only to protect the integrity of the PPP program and the taxpayer, taxpayer funds it was loaning out, but also to send a clear message of deterrence to would-be fraudsters while loans were still being made, that the department was standing watch, and that we would move aggressively to prosecute those who would try to defraud this critical program. We are here this morning to announce a key milestone in the Criminal Division's efforts to combat pandemic-related fraud by holding accountable those who sought to abuse the PPP. Today, the Criminal Division's fraud section along with our law enforcement partners on this stage and elsewhere in this room, 
are announcing that as a result of law enforcement operations over the course of the last few days, and in fact over the course of the last few hours, the criminal division has now criminally charged more than 50 people who allegedly committed fraud to obtain money from the Paycheck Protection Program. This impressive number of charged defendants is in addition to a number of cases that have been brought by U.S. attorneys' offices around the country, with the criminal division's leadership help and support. Those offices have been an important part of the department's efforts as well to combat PPP fraud. Joining me on stage today to make this important announcement are a number of key partners who have been integral to this effort, including Rob Zink, the Deputy, Attor the Deputy Assistant Attorney General who oversees our fraud section, representatives from the FBI, the Small Business Association's Office of the Inspector General, the Internal Revenue Service, the U.S. Postal Service, excuse me, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, and the Offices of Inspectors General from the FDIC and the FHFA. They have been critical partners in this effort, and you will hear from them directly shortly. But before we do that, let me take a moment to briefly mention some of the individuals charged in recent days that have taken us past this important milestone of 50 charged defendants. Yesterday, our law enforcement partners arrested defendant Tierra Walker in Miami, who is, allegedly, who is alleged to have been part of a criminal ring that attempted to steal approximately $24 million of PPP funds. Another, another member of that ring, defendant Joshua Bellamy, was arrested just this morning in Miami. And just a few hours ago, charges were unsealed against seven other individuals alleged to have been part of a separate criminal ring that tried to steal and launder several hundred thousand dollars in stolen PPP funds. Separately, law enforcement partners again this morning arrested defendants Larry Jordan and Sutuk L this morning in Buffalo, New York. They are alleged to have tried to steal $7.6 million in PPP funds. Now, it's important to remember that in announcing these charges and referencing these defendants, that these are merely allegations. Each, de each defendant charged is presumed to be innocent unless and until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, as I mentioned, these charges, in conjunction with charges previously brought by the Criminal Division's Fraud Section since early May of this year, bring the total number of defendants charged by the Criminal Division with PPP-related fraud to 57. These numbers are revealing. The cases we have charged involve attempts to steal over $175 million from the PPP and actual losses to the federal government of over $70 million. Now, through our swift efforts to date, we have been able to recover or freeze over $30 million in PPP funds, and we expect to add to that total in the future as we seize additional funds and liquidate assets that defendants have purchased using illegally obtained PPP funds. Our cases are diverse in size and scope involving fraud ranging from requests for just $30,000 to, as I mentioned before, approximately $24 million. And they span the country. We have brought charges in no fewer than 19 separate judicial districts across the United States. I think it's important to recognize that these are not simple or easy cases to investigate, build, or charge. These are white-collar matters. They often involve obtaining and then piecing together often complex financial, payroll, and tax records for individuals and companies and sifting through other evidence. This makes it all the more remarkable that the Department has been able to bring so many cases so quickly and is a testament to the hard work and dedication of our attorneys, agents, and partners across the U.S. government. I would like to take a moment this morning to explain the two general categories into which you'll, by and large, see our PPP cases fall. The first category involves individuals or small groups acting on their own who lied about having legitimate businesses or who claimed that they needed PPP money for things like paying workers or paying bills, but instead used it to buy splashy luxury items for themselves. As we allege in a number of our charging documents, these defendants used lies to obtain millions of dollars in PPP funds and then spent those funds not on their workers, but on things like luxury cars, homes, renovations, diamond jewelry, even adult entertainment, and trips to Las Vegas. Now, the second category of cases that I'd like to focus on here this morning 
are the coordinated criminal rings that have engaged in systematic, organized conduct to loot the PPP. The involvement of these rings is unsurprising, but it is particularly troubling to us here at the Department, and we will be focusing on these types of cases going forward. As one example, we recently filed charges in Cleveland and Miami against 11 individuals, including a professional athlete and his business manager. This group of defendants allegedly worked together to try to obtain a total of $24 million in PPP funds using falsified records and fraudulent application materials. As an example of the teamwork involved in these cases, to unravel this particular case, the fraud section of the Department of Justice partnered with the FBI, the IRS Office of Criminal Investigations, the SBA's Office of Inspector General, and the FDIC's Office of Inspector General, as well as U.S. Attorney's Offices in the Northern District of Ohio and the Southern District of Florida. As I mentioned, these law enforcement organizations and our partner U.S. Attorneys have been a key part of the Criminal Division's efforts to combat PPP-related fraud, and we expect our joint work to continue going forward. Now, as you can see from our charging documents in these cases, they are, full, they are of all different types and different sizes. While we've taken aim at a wide variety of schemes, there are a few common threads that I think it's important to highlight today. First are the brazen, bold, and simply false representations that we allege the defendants made in their application materials for PPP funds. These alleged misrepresentations typically centered on the nature and existence of the businesses defendants were claiming to need funds for, and included misrepresentations about things like the number of employees they had, their average monthly revenue and payroll figures, and the applicant's criminal backgrounds, or lack thereof. And in many cases, these defendants didn't stop at simply making false statements to lenders, but rather tried to back up their alleged lies with fake documents, like falsified tax documents, dummy payroll and revenue records, and in some cases, even stolen personal information from unsuspecting third parties. Now, a second common thread amongst the cases that we've charged is the defendant's use of their stolen PPP funds for entirely illegitimate purposes, as I mentioned just a few moments ago. We allege that many of these defendants took the relief money offered by the PPP and spent it on things having absolutely nothing to do with relief, again, often on luxury items for themselves and their families, such as cars, jewelry, travel, and other personal expenses. For example, in late July, we charged defendant David Hines in my of Miami with fraudulently obtaining almost $4 million in PPP funds, and then using those funds in part to buy an exotic $320,000 Lamborghini sports car. And in, in August, we charged five defendants with fraudulently obtaining millions in PPP funds and using them, again in part, to buy a luxury Mercedes, a Range Rover, and over $125,000 in jewelry. PPP funds, as I mentioned earlier, were intended to help keep American businesses afloat. They were intended to help ordinary, everyday Americans pay their bills and put food on the table. I can assure you that they were not intended to help support fraudsters' dreams of owning Lamborghinis, Rolls Royces, Range Rovers, or Diamonds. A third key point to remember in all these cases is a fairly obvious one. The money these defendants stole was taxpayer money. Every dollar received was a dollar drawn from the American people's account. Even worse, every dollar they took was a dollar that we had all set aside to help our fellow Americans weather one of the worst national crises in recent history. And as we allege, these defendants tried to steal those funds for themselves. A fourth key point, which is related to the one I just mentioned, is that in each and every one of these cases, the success of the defendant's fraudulent loan applications meant that there were fewer funds available at that time in the PPP for legitimate businesses that were in genuine need of economic support. You don't need to look very far in the press to see reports of the unbelievable pace at which PPP funds and loans were snapped up by businesses. The program was so popular that the initial tranche of funds was quickly exhausted and Congress had to reauthorize the program, making billions of additional dollars available to American businesses. This program was popular for the simple reason that American businesses and American workers needed the money to pay their bills during a crisis. They needed to the help then. They needed to the help quickly. 
But these defendants decided that they wanted the money to line their pockets instead. By doing so, they prevented or delayed other businesses with very legitimate needs from accessing these critical funds. Now, these cases are all tremendously important for many reasons, especially during this period of a national emergency. And there are some critical aspects of our investigation and prosecution of these cases that I'd like to highlight today. The first is the unparalleled speed with which these cases have been investigated and prosecuted. The PPP hasn't even been in existence for six months, and yet here we are today announcing that 57 defendants have been charged by the criminal division at the Department of Justice, and even more charges have been brought by our U.S. attorney partners. Our efforts here in the criminal division began the very same day that the SBA launched the PPP with the formal creation of a team in the fraud section under the leadership of Fraud Section Chief Rob Zink devoted to PPP-related investigations and prosecutions. Our prosecutors and the group of agencies represented on this stage and in this room today moved quickly to establish law, enfor law enforcement partnerships, obtain critical data and evidence, and take concrete affirmative steps to identify fraud committed against the PPP. Just one month later, the division brought the very first series of PPP-related cases. This pace is, to our knowledge, without precedent in the history of the Department's white-collar enforcement efforts. Second, I'd like to highlight the division's use of data analytics to develop these cases so quickly. As I mentioned before, there were over 5.2 million individual PPP loans made under this program. To bring these cases as quickly as we have and to sort through the high volume of loans made by the SBI, the fraud section and its partners deployed first-in-class data analytical capabilities that they have developed and employed to great effect in other criminal investigative areas, such as healthcare fraud and market, man market manipul manipulation investigations and cases that we have brought. The fraud section has truly become a market leader in its use and development of these data analytic techniques and here again, we see their potential to bring criminal charges quickly and efficiently. A third key component of these cases is our ability to use public-private partnerships to maximize our awareness and visibility of suspicious conduct and our collection of critical evidence. Many fi financial institutions and banks, such as credit unions and other banks, have been strong partners in assisting us in detecting and investigating potentially fraudulent activity in connection with the PPP and other government aid programs, and safeguarding taxpayer dollars by spotting fraud and freezing funds or accounts. I would like to thank these institutions for their support and their assistance in this effort. And finally, I would like to highlight the whole of government approach that we have employed in bringing these cases. This is not only reflect reflected by the agencies represented here before you today, but by our U.S. attorney partners and others across the government who have enabled the nationwide scope of our efforts here. Again, I'll note in particular our partners here on stage, who you'll hear from in just a minute. It would not have been possible to stand up this program so quickly or to investigate and charge so many cases so fast without their steadfast assistance. This has truly been a team effort, and so I want to thank all of you and your respective teams for everything that you've done to achieve these results on this incredibly fast timetable for the American people. Now, these 50-plus cases are significant in and of themselves, but you should also know that there is more to come. Our work is ongoing. We are not done here yet. The agencies represented behind me and the prosecutors here in the criminal division are working tirelessly to help during this time of national emergency by bringing accountability to those who would victimize the American people. And I should point out that these cases are not brought at a time when the criminal division's fraud section prosecutors are sitting idle. As you may know, the fraud section has charged a record number of individual and corporate criminal cases and resolved a record number of corporate cases over the past three years. We've been incredibly busy policing the markets and holding individual and corporate wrongdoers accountable for their misconduct. Just this year, despite the challenges COVID-19 has posed to our investigations, the fraud section alone has announced criminal charges against more than 125 individual defendants separate and apart from our PPP-related efforts. And with respect to corporate crime, the fraud section this year has resolved seven corporate criminal cases and imposed over $940 million 
in corporate criminal monetary penalties here in the U.S., with worldwide monetary penalties, restitution, and disgorgement totaling over $4.5 billion. There will, there will be much more to come in terms of corporate and individual criminal enforcement between now and the year's end from the fraud section. I just want to highlight that the work that we've done in connection with the PPP program has been in addition to and not in lieu of our traditional work. So again, my thanks to everyone here today for their hard work and their dedication to this program. I would also like to thank in particular Attorney General Barr for his leadership on this issue. He quickly recognized at the outset of the pandemic the significant potential for COVID-related fraud, and he directed us in the Criminal Division to bring the Department's resources to bear to help the American people. I'm here today to tell you that we have done so and that we will continue to do so. Today is a significant milestone, but we have more to do, much more to do. We are fortunate to have such a dedicated and talented team in place. And I want to close with what I hope will be an unmistakable message to those who might consider abusing federal programs like the PPP that provide critical lifelines for American businesses and American workers. You will be identified. You will be held accountable. You will face the severest of consequences for trying to exploit your fellow American suffering for your own personal gain. The Department of Justice, with our partners across the government, will continue to use every tool available to ensure the integrity of relief provided by the federal government during this unprecedented national emergency. The American people expect and deserve nothing less. So thank you very much for being here today. I'd like to now turn it over to Rob Zink, Acting Deputy Assistant Attorney General overseeing the fraud section and the leader of our work in the PPP area to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I want to take a moment to echo the Assistant Attorney General's comments. The PPP at its core was a program designed to help small businesses and employees weather the storm caused by the pandemic. We had all hoped that applicants, that is, those who applied for monies from the PPP, would do so in good faith, based on legitimate need, and by providing true and accurate facts. But we were prepared for some to take advantage of the system. Now, from our first charge in May to now, the Criminal Division's fraud section has been on the beat. We have been holding to account those who would and did steal taxpayer dollars meant for businesses and employees most in need. We've charged over 50 individuals with various federal crimes for their conduct. Cases of all stripes and varieties involving a range of amounts spanning from professionals to convicted felons without fear or favor and without regard to station or status. I am proud of the women and men of the Criminal Division's Fraud Section, and I thank each of them for their tireless and unrelenting work during this period of national emergency. I also want to thank the Assistant Attorney General, Brian Rabbit. From the outset of our work, Brian has ensured our teams have been positioned to succeed. Our efforts here today are a direct result of the AAG's steadfast leadership and unwavering support. Thank you, Brian. I also want to personally thank our law enforcement partners represented here on the stage and in this room today. The results that you see that you've heard about have happened with and only because of this particular coalition of law enforcement partners. They are the FBI, the SBA Office of Inspector General, the FDIC Office of Inspector General, IRS Criminal Investigations, the United States Postal Inspection Service, and the FHFA Office of Inspector General. Thank you each. Now, before turning it over to FBI Deputy Assistant Director Jimenez, I'd also like to recognize other of our key law enforcement partners, each of whom have been critical to our efforts to combat PPP fraud. They are the Treasury Department's Inspector General for Tax Administration, the DEA, HHS Office of Inspector General, the Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigations, and the Federal Reserve Board Office of Inspector General. Thank you all. With that, I'll turn it over to FBI Deputy Assistant Director Jimenez. 
JJ. Thanks, Rob. Good morning. I'm proud to stand with my colleagues from the Department of Justice and our law enforcement partners in this fight. The FBI has worked to counter the threats posed by COVID-19 fraud schemes and illicit finance activities since the start of the pandemic. But these threats are pervasive and have become more frequent and sophisticated. We've seen criminals employing a variety of schemes to include fraudulently applying for PPP loans and targeting those funds once they have been dispersed. To effectively combat this growing threat, the FBI, along with our partners, formed a PPP fraud working group in partnership uh, with the our DOJ uh, and federal partners. Through the efforts of our field offices around the country and the, PP the PPP working group, we've opened several hundred PPP-related investigations. We've identified nearly 500 PPP-related subjects, individuals we believe have fraudulently requested or received hundreds of millions of dollars in CARE Act stimulus funds directed to PPP loans. It's resulting in numerous arrests, indictments, and convictions. We take this fraudulent activity seriously and aggressively investigate each, but we cannot do it alone. That's why our federal partnerships with the DOJ and our uh, federal law enforcement partners that you see here today uh, are so vital in this fight. We also need the public's help. We need you to be aware of the signs that fraud is being committed, and we need you to report what you see to your local FBI field office. The repercussions of the pandemic won't end anytime soon, so we must remain vigilant. Together, we can reduce the threat of COVID-19 related criminal activity so the American public can focus on protecting themselves and their family, families during these trying times. Thank you. Good morning. Today marks an important milestone in our fight against fraud in SBA's pay Paycheck Protection Program but it is a milestone that unfortunately will be surpassed many times. I share the sentiments of my colleagues and want to express my gratitude to Acting Assistant Attorney General Rabbit, the U.S. Attorney's offices across the nation, and our law enforcement partners that work closely with SBA OIG investigators to pursue wrongdoers. I also want to thank the brave men and women that bring forward allegations of wrongdoing by contacting our hot hotline and reaching out in other ways. They are driven by a sense of justice with which we all share. We recognize at the outset that strong internal controls and clear guidelines could serve as a preventative measure and antidote, if you will, to fraud in SBA's pandemic response programs. That's why we published a report early on that suggested actions that SBA leadership could consider and our investigators sought out partnerships across the law enforcement community to prepare for fraudsters that put personal greed in front of our nation's economic vi vitality, which is fueled, of course, by America's smart small businesses. It is through diligence and intentional effort that we can pause to note the success of these efforts. Within 60 days of the first round of Paycheck Protection Program lending, Two businessmen were charged in the District of Rhode Island with allegedly filing bank loan applications seeking more than half a million dollars in forgivable PPP loans. This was the first in the nation for PPP-related charges. It sent a strong message that the Department of Justice, that SBOIG and our law enforcement partners are poised and dedicated to justice, and today's announcement should only be interpreted as, we will be persistent in our continued pursuit of the same. The pandemic presented a whole of government challenge and fraudsters were waiting in the wings to find vulnerabilities and schemes to bypass controls and gain access to these funds. As I stand here with my colleagues, I wanna assure our citizens that the fraudsters will receive a whole of government response and we will relentlessly pursue evidence of wrongdoing. We will do so by working both smarter and harder leveraging data analytics and technology to root out fraud. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's Mike Ware, the Inspector General from the SBA. I'll turn it over now to Jay Lerner, the Inspector General from the FDIC. 
Thank you, Rob. Good morning. The Office of Inspector General at the FDIC is proud to be a member of this strike force team combating stimulus fraud against the PPP program under the CARES Act. As you may know, the PPP program was designed and established to provide relief to hardworking Americans and small businesses across the country, those that are most in need and suffering during these challenging times of the pandemic crisis. Defrauding the PPP program directly affects the resources available, uh, the resources available to help those small businesses and workers in, uh, to survive and get back on their feet. These complex multi-million dollar PPP cases send a strong signal, a message of deterrence that we are determined and vigilant and we will investigate and prosecute those that defraud the government programs moving money through the banks, especially ones that are funded by American taxpayer dollars. In addition, the fraudulent activity puts the, the banks at risk dealing with such corrupt individuals, and we will continue to help preserve the integrity of the banking sector. Effective partnerships are critical to these matters, and the cases could not be successful without such collaboration. The FDIC OIG it stands ready and is committed to work with our law enforcement colleagues. First, we commend the leadership of the criminal division at DOJ, especially the fraud section. And as an alumnus, I am pleased to work with such fine prosecutors. In addition, we are grateful for the support and leadership of each of the U.S. attorneys and AUSAs involved in these PPP cases, as well as the coordination of the Executive Office of U.S. Attorneys and its Stimulus Fraud Working Group. Also, we appreciate the cooperation of our other law enforcement partners and agencies, the FBI, IRS, Criminal Investigations, Postal Inspection Service, and others, as well as our federal, fellow offices of inspectors general. Further, we are also proud to be a member of the recently formed Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, the PRAC. That's a group of uh, IGs that are, it's comp comprised of 20 IGs um, to conduct oversight and hold folks accountable uh, for these government programs. The PRAC operates under the leadership of the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, SIGI. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize and personally thank the many fine, uh, outstanding special agents of the FDIC OIG for all their hard work, persistence, and perseverance uh, and dedication to these important cases. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jay. We'll turn it over to Jim Lee, Deputy Chief, IRS Criminal Investigations. Jim. Thank you. So listening to the remarks today, sitting uh, here in the room and on the side uh, and thinking about the PPP program, you know, in general, um, I can't help but be disgusted. Uh, it seems there's no morality amongst criminals. And there, it's, it also seems like nothing is off limits for them. We're talking about individuals here that are, that are exploiting this pandemic the likes of which we haven't seen in more than 100 years. Stealing money from honest, hardworking Americans that are just trying to stay on their feet. It's unbelievable, although many of us in the room expected that this would happen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jim Lee. I'm the Deputy Chief with IRS Criminal Investigation, and I'm honored to represent the agency. <clears throat> Now, some of you might be thinking that 50 cases doesn't sound real overwhelming, uh, 50 plus cases, but let me give you a little more perspective uh, and why this is really significant. These cases represent more than 50 individuals now being held accountable for their actions. We're talking about millions of dollars being stolen instead of going to people that are desperately in need. We're talking about hundreds of hours agencies are using or are taken to prosecute fraudulent claims, as opposed to spending that time processing legitimate requests. We're also talking about thousands of hours my law enforcement partners are spending chasing down these criminals, as opposed to working on other mission-critical efforts. 
I could not be more proud of the men and women with an IRS criminal investigation and really the IRS as a whole and how we're handling this pandemic and the partnerships that we have here with the agencies that are speaking today. I'd like to leave you with just a couple thoughts. There's no borders anymore in the world. The internet connects people, TV, social media, digital, me digital media all connect people, but law enforcement partnerships connect people as well. These partnerships, they suck the oxygen out of the space where these criminals like to operate. And these par partnerships also make it hard for criminals to take advantage of these programs. And as a result, the money goes to those who actually need it. So I'll close with a message to the criminals perpetrating these COVID-related type schemes. You know, as you've heard, you know, some of these cases involve criminals flaunting stolen money to buy fancy cars or boats, or jewelry. Maybe they're just gambling it away. However, those of you out there that think you're smart, you know, think you're staying under the radar because you're not flaunting the stolen money, you know, I'm here to tell you that you're not smart. We all see you and you cannot hide from these paper and digital trails that you're leaving behind for us to follow. So thank you to all our partners here today and thank you in advance for the work that we're gonna to continue to do moving forward to combat these crimes. And with that, I'd like to introduce the next speaker, Craig Goldberg, the Deputy Chief Inspector, Postal Inspection Service. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, I'm Craig Goldberg, Deputy Chief Postal Inspector with the United States Postal Inspection Service. Thank you to Acting Assistant Attorney General Rabbit and the Department of Justice for the opportunity to reflect today on our role with these important investigations. The Paycheck Protection Program, PPP, was established as a lifeline to America's small businesses during the pandemic. And unfortunately, a number of PPP recipients have allegedly defrauded that program. In doing so, these alleged scammers have deprived potentially deserving small businesses of critical funds. In some cases, it is alleged that fraudulently obtained funds have been spent on frivolous material expenses, such as exotic sports cars and houses. This is especially cruel to those deserving American small business owners who were unable to receive PPP funds and who may have to close their doors and lay off their employees. The Postal Inspection Service is committed to combating this insidious fraud. With our federal law enforcement partners, including the Department of Justice, the FBI, SBA OIG, IRS CI, FDIC OIG, FHFA OIG, and our many other partners. In addition to the many postal inspectors investigating fraud across our 17 field divisions, the Postal Inspection Service also has a team of postal inspectors embedded within the Department of Justice's fraud section, conducting major fraud investigations, including investigations of significant PPP fraud and other CARES Act related fraud. These postal inspectors are relentless in their pursuit of justice on behalf of the American public. Today's announcement of the 50th arrest related to PPP fraud is a significant milestone to be recognized. And I am proud of the Postal Inspection Service's investigative efforts that have helped lead to this accomplishment. However, it should be noted that this is not the end of the Postal Inspection Service's efforts. The Postal Inspection Service and our federal law enforcement partners will be tireless in pursuing those who have defrauded the PPP and other CARES Act programs. On a final note, I want to encourage the public to report to federal law enforcement information they have about suspected PPP fraud. It is often through the public's help that we identify and bring to justice these scammers. You can report suspected PPP fraud to federal law enforcement by calling the Department of Justice Disaster Fraud Hotline at 866-720-5271. You can also file a complaint with the Postal Inspection Service at our website, www.uspis.gov. Thank you, and I would now like to introduce Richard Parker, Acting Deputy Inspector General for Investigations with FHFA OIG. Uh, 
Now, on behalf of Inspector General Laura Wertheimer, I want to thank you, Mr. Rabbit, Bob, for the opportunity to stand beside you and our colleagues in law enforcement in this remarkable effort to ensure integrity and uphold accountability in the critical federal programs enacted during these difficult times. Even as the federal government moves swiftly to support small businesses through the Paycheck Protection Program, certain individuals attempted to enrich themselves by fraudulently obtaining paycheck protection loans. And when these individuals attempted to do so through the federal home loan bank member institutions that fall within FHFA OIG's jurisdiction, we took swift action to thwart them. We have successfully partnered with the fraud section to expeditiously investigate and charge many of the defendants discussed today. And through our concerted actions, we have disrupted the funding of fraudulent paycheck protection loans and frozen ill-gotten proceeds before they could be dissipated. This cooperative law enforcement effort highlights the significant likelihood of being caught and serves as a warning to others who may contemplate engaging in such behavior. FHFA OIG is committed to continuing to work actively with the department and our partners in law enforcement to ensure those responsible for committing such crimes are held accountable. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you again to all of our partners who are here today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the efforts uh, that you see reflected in the numbers on the boards here beside me would not have been possible uh, without their, their support and their hard work. Uh, I believe we have uh, some time for a number of questions, uh, both for folks here in the room uh, as well as folks on the phone. Um, I will try to answer those, and if I can't, I may pull in uh, one of our partners or Rob uh, to handle the question or to supplement my answer. So, Matt. We will now begin the question and answer session. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing the keys. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. At this time, we will pause momentarily to assemble our roster. Our first question comes from Kelly Madrich with Politico. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I'm attending remotely. My question is basically how widespread do you think that the PPP fraud is? I just heard the FBI official identify nearly 500 individuals and have opened several hundred investigations. Can you provide any more clarity on that in terms of how much fraud do you think is out there? Is there a dollar value or anything like that? Thank you, and I'll mute the line line. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I think it's difficult as we stand here today to put a concrete number uh, on either the amount of fraudulent uh, loans that we suspect are out there uh, or the dollar figure. Uh, I can tell you that, that we do believe it's significant. The, the amount of fraud that we've uncovered to date and that we've prosecuted to date is significant. Uh, the amount of fraud that we're currently investigating and that we anticipate charging in the future is also significant. And given what we've seen so far, we believe that there is an additional uh, set of fraudulent activity out there that we intend to uh, continue pursuing. So while it's difficult to put concrete numbers on it, I, I do think that there will be plenty of work for us to do uh, in the months going forward, and we intend to do it. Again, if you have a question, please press star then one. Please stand by as we poll for questions. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then one. Well, it appears we have no further questions, so with that, we'll bring the press conference to a close. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today, and I'd like to thank uh, our criminal division attorneys. Uh, and our law enforcement organization partners for all of their work on this important initiative. I hope to be back with you uh, in the near future uh, with even further updates about the good and critical work that we continue to do. Thank you.